Hello, everyone. Welcome to Max Min 2024. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Richard James from the University of Minnesota, who will talk about objective molecular dynamics in classical and quantum mechanics. Over to you, Dick, please. Yes, thanks, Vitaly, and uh, many thanks for inviting me to this, this uh, really interesting and uh, unusual, there's no conference quite like this um, series, and I, I hope it continues. It's a, it's a nice forum. I'll speak about something I've been working on for quite a while. It goes back to when Kaushik Dial was a postdoc. And, um, and, and we keep finding interesting ways to think about it and inter interesting ways to use it. And most, most recently in quantum mechanics, it's, but basically it's a method of molecular dynamics. So I'm That's what I'm going to describe. And it's a way, it's a method in which, um, the atoms fill all of space and all the atoms filling all of space satisfy exactly the equations of molecular dynamics. Um, so I, I want to tell you how, how we do that, how we deal with infinitely many atoms. Um, and it's not, it doesn't, it's it's not every kind of solution in MD. It's only a particular kinds of solutions. And so I'll tell you what they are. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So I'll start by uh, some simple observations here. This is a carbon nanotube um, with some chirality, as you can see. And I focus for a moment on the, the two atoms with the red dots. And they, they seem to be kind of in, um, situated differently in this molecule. Um, but in fact, if you, if you imagine sitting on that red dot, that you could take the top red dot, and you look in the direction of the yellow arrow. Um, and then alternatively, you sit on the other red dot and look look in the direction of its red arrow. You see the, you see the same environment out to infinity. So you look this way or you look this way. And 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 if you want, you could take a picture. You'll 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 the two pictures are exactly the same. So uh this this chiral carbon nanotube has the property that you could say it informally that that all atoms, every atom sees the same environment. And uh, that's, a, that's a property I've been studying and it's related to this method of molecular dynamics. So to, to, to tell you a little bit about that um, property, I'm, I'm gonna focus on the periodic table. I'm gonna say something about the periodic table with regard to this, this observation about identical environments. So and, and to make to to say say what I'm going to say I'm going to I'm going to eliminate the last row or it, and the these um, you know you I'm only taking the these first few rows of the periodic table because what I say won't be true for many of these radioactive elements. Also, astatine there's only one gram on Earth at any one time and nobody really knows its structure. So. So that's uh, that's my uh, truncated periodic table, you could say. And um, the way most people think about structure is is in terms of Bravais lattices. So the simplest structures are simply Bravais lattices, integers on three linearly independent vectors, and um, and more complex structures are are sets of Bravais lattices made with the same lattice vectors. In other words. Uh, Bravais lattices, and but um, translated with respect to each other, and so you might have um, you might have ten different atoms or, or in different positions, and you you just you know reproduce this Bravais lattice um, centered on each of them. So, for example, FCC, you can use these three vectors, and and it's a Bravais lattice, and um, integers on those three vectors generate the lattice. Well, this is all elementary stuff. Um, so I'm going to now take the periodic table and for for to be clear about exactly what I'm doing, I, I use I used this Pearson's handbook of crystallographic data, which gives structures. And I, I took the most common structure at room temperature if that was possible. And if the structure was not solid at room temperature, then I took T equals zero. So just to get a just to get a particular structure for each element in the in this truncated periodic table, and so you can ask, uh, you know, which of the elements 
naturally form brevet lattices. And you can see about half the elements do. So I've, I've blackened out the elements that, that do not form brave lattices. And, um, and, and okay, now I want to redo this exercise. And, um, but I want to use this idea of identical environments. So I, I, I want to, I'll say, this is a definition of an objective atomic structure. So a set of points is, uh, is, is an objective atomic structure if, and now you can look here, you, if you, you, take, you take the first one um, and you take all the other, you take all the other atoms in the structure, that's the XJs, you set, subtract the first one, you do an orthogonal transformation and you add it back to the ith one and you get the structure back again. That's just a mathematical way of saying that that all atoms in the structure see the same environment out to infinity. Um, so, for example, this structure is uh, an objective atomic structure. Every every atom sees the same environment by the by this definition. So now I'm going to go back to the periodic table, and I'm going to ask which of the elements naturally crystallize in in objective atomic structures. And uh, and so again, I'll blacken out the elements that do not form objective atomic structures. And this is what you get. Um, you, you we don't know about astatine, so I I don't I blackened it out. And um, and the the only example in the periodic table that does not form an objective atomic structure is manganese. So manganese is a very interesting element. Um, and uh, there's reasons for that. There's some kind of ambiguity. There's some kind of um, degeneracy in in um, in um, manganese that um, makes it so that it do it doesn't form an object objective atomic structure. But some of them have many many choices, like uh, boron. Of course, there's the many structures of carbon, including the diamond lattice. Every atom sees the same environment. Buckyballs. Every atom sees the same environment. Um, and it, carbon nanotubes of any chirality, they, each atom sees the same environment. Phosphorus forms this famous structure. Uh, sulfur forms these uh, this kind of distorted ring, but every atom sees the same environment. And uh, the alkali halides also form these layered structures, and every atom sees exactly the same environment. So this this intrigued me, um, and and I began to think about uh, you know structure in this way. It's uh, instead of thinking about how you stack things to build up a structure, you you, you one should think about in environments of atoms. And um, of course, these are not we if we were like in Andy's situation, he's dealing with complex molecules. you you know, this concept would not apply because uh, obviously, uh, you know, different atoms in the molecule see the same environment. Uh, see different environments, I'm sorry to say. Um, but you can uh, generalize to 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 molecular structure. So the concept, and it won't include everything, but uh, it, it does include some remarkable number of molecules. And so it's it's an objective molecular structure. And I'll tell you about what it is mathematically, but what it is geometrically is that you you divide the structure into molecules. And um, and and then you 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 number the atoms within a molecule. Let's say molecule one. You number the atom, atoms one to m in molecule one, and um, and then you go to a different molecule. And if you number them correctly, then then all the all the atoms with um, the, then corresponding atoms in different molecules see the same environment. So you have to number each one in the right way, but then corresponding atoms in, in the molecule see the same environment. So you, again, you say that mathematically by, you have a double index notation. Um, so I in the indexes the molecule and J indexes the atom within the molecule. So us usually N, N might be infinite and M is always finite. Um, and uh, and then the the definition is it's is similar to the one I had before. So if you take all the all the other positions of all the other atoms, um, so n and m are arbitrary, and you 
you subtract the, the atom at position K in molecule one, you do an orthogonal transformation, which depends on I and K, add it back to atom position I comma K, and you get the structure back again. That's just a way of saying that corresponding atoms in different molecules see the same environment. Um, and here's a theorem you can prove. It says that, uh, so there's, you, 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 you might think there's some group structure to this, and indeed there is a group structure. So after a suitable renumbering of atoms, and you have to allow overlapping molecules, but it's, it's not a big deal, then every objective structure is the orbit of a finite number of atomic positions under a discrete group of isometries. So really, we're talking about uh, take a bunch of atomic positions, put them anywhere, take isometry, take a, uh, one of the isometry groups, uh, act it on those, and you, you get the whole structure. Um, and we also, we also think about uh, you know, how quasi-crystals might fall into this this idea or similar uh, some kind of similar idea and um you, you know if you think of a penrose tiling you you might have two tiles let's say so you and if you think about that you you, you think about take a point in the structure there's only a, if you, and you give the size of the environment you draw a circle around a point in the penrose tiling and you look at what's inside this circle then of course there's only a finite number of ways to to arrange two tiles within a circle of finite radius. So that means there is a finite number of local environments. So that's a that's a way to think of quasicrystals. That's the way we think of quasicrystals. And some of the ideas that I'm 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 express, expressing here also go over to quasicrystals with that idea. Okay, so maybe if you're not familiar with isometry groups, um, that's his uh, elementary presentation. So they consist of elements Q and C. Q is an orthogonal tensor or three by three matrix. C is a vector in three dimensions. Um, isometries can act on points in R3. That's what I've been, that's the rule I've been using by the simplest possible rule. G of X is QX plus C. Uh, if you have two isometries, then this is how you multiply them. So that's the rule for multiplication. And that just corresponds to composition of mappings. So G1 times G2 of X is, is G1 of G2 of X, where G1 of X, G of X is, is represented here. And the identity is identity zero. And the main repository for the um, isometry groups is the International Tables of Crystallography, but mostly those, most of the volumes deal with, I think there's volume E that, that does something with um, non-periodic cases, but uh, most of the volumes deal with cases where the group contains three linearly independent translations like this IE1, IE2, and IE3. Okay, so those are isometry groups. I'm gonna be using those. And I'm doing, going to do molecular dynamics, so I'm going to allow the the group elements to depend on time, but in a very particular way. the The Q is not allowed to depend on time, and the C, the translation part, can be affine in time. Of course, it still has to be a group, so you have to work that out. But uh, uh, those are the ones that I'll use. So, for example, the translation group would be written this way, where at the bottom with new one, new two, new three as integers. And so what I'm saying is the, the allowed uh, time dependence is that E1, E2, E3 can be written in, in an affine way. And what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write them in a particular affine way using a three by three matrix A. So the translation group can be made time dependent with this strong restriction, but but only in, in this way. And, and the the total freedom you have is a three by three matrix A. You'll see in uh, my molecular dynamic simulations, numerous choices of this A. Choices of the A will, will correspond to some macroscopic flow. I'll, I'll tell you about which those which flows those are. Okay, uh, since I'm doing molecular dynamics, I have to tell you a little bit about atomic forces. Um, the, the, um, the uh, the atomic forces will depend on the positions of all the atoms. Typically, there'll be infinitely many of them. Um, and it satisfies this standard invariance. That's frame indifference. That's you you're allowed to translate 
and also rotate in this particular way with the same translation and rotation in all cases, and you get you you can bring the Q out and the C goes away. Permutation invariance is also satisfied. If you switch the positions of like atoms, then then you get the you get the same force or in which so you get this requirement. So those are very basic. Uh, uh, those are the two very basic symmetries of the forces in molecular dynamics from quantum mechanical point of view, non-relativistic, let's say. Um, maybe it's easier to think of those in terms of the potential energy. Um, so the potential energy is invariant under switching atoms of like species, and it's also frame indifferent in this way. I the reason I didn't write it with the potential energy is mostly I'm dealing with infinite numbers of atoms, so the potential energy would be infinite. So, okay. So now again, let me try to make a notation, which um, which is going to be useful for this molecular dynamics, but it also can be thought of in terms of the um, objective molecular uh, structures that I described earlier. So I have a double index. I goes from one to N and K goes from one to M. Again, if you want to think of those as molecules, then um, I, rep I indexes the molecule and K indexes the atom within the molecule. But this method will be much more general than molecules. Mostly I'm not dealing with molecules because the atoms are going to get all mixed up, you know, and, uh, and, and, and there will be no, any, no conceivable idea of a molecule in the simulations. But anyway, the notation is similar. And then the I equals one will correspond to the simulated atoms. And um, so M can be anything, but it's finite. N is typically infinite. If I use the translation group, N will be infinite. And and now I, I'm going to, so those are those are the ones I'm going to actually simulate. The, the, the I one, one comma K. Those are the ones I'm going to actually simulate. And oops. And then, and then the non-simulated atoms are going to be given by group action on the simulated atoms, but the group will have time dependence as I described because of its the translation has time dependence. Okay, so that's so the following theorem exploits those two invariances, um, and it's independent of material. So it's so and here's the theorem: you assume the restrictions on the potential energy above that I gave above. So that's frame indifference and permutation invariance. Let this G be a discrete group of isometries. Typically N is infinite. And there's always was a restriction on time dependence given above. This means the only the translations can depend on time and they can only depend affinely on time. And now let the simulated atoms that's why one comma k satisfy the equations of molecular dynamics. So there they are. So the there's and and of course the right hand side depends on all the atoms, you know, all the positions because the simulated atoms interact with everything. And um, but of course the things on the right hand side, the non-simulated atoms are given by formulas using the group based on the simulated atoms. So secretly, the right-hand side only depends on the positions of the simulated atoms because we are using formulas to determine the positions of the non-simulated atoms. And then you see this is uh, these are ODEs in standard form. So if I prescribe initial conditions, I can solve those ODEs. And the the miracle of this invariance is that if that if you solve these and you get, use the formulas to find the non-simulated atoms. Even though the non-simulated atoms are just given by formulas, they satisfy exactly the equations of molecular dynamics for their forces. Okay, so you simulate the simulated atoms. You get the at every time step, you get the non-simulated atoms by some formulas. The non-simulated each non-simulated atom is is satisfying molecular dynamics for its forces. Okay, the proof of this is. Easy. You just um, it's just a calculation. You you just use these group properties. You use both the permutation invariance and the t time dependence, and you just show directly that the non-simulated atoms satisfy the equations of molecular dynamics. I'll, I can say a little bit more of why why I you know it would be wonderful maybe to have uh, allow the Q to depend on T as well, but um, um, the 
the the proof the proof used this used right on step one there used the this thing in the red box the fact that and that if you if you work out you know the fact you you associate a skew tensor w with with the q and you work this out then it this this condition which is the only way I know of to make sure that the non-simulated atoms satisfy the equations of molecular dynamics is is this condition, and you can you can see that there, there there's no the only way realistic way to satisfy this equation in any kind of generality is to make um, c double dot is zero and w equals zero, which means that q is constant and the and the affine and the translation is affine in time. Okay. Uh, okay, very good. And then the translation group is 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 this particular case. So that a lot of uh, so that for the next uh, few slides, I'm going to be discussing the translation group. So each time I discuss it, I have to give this three by three matrix A. Okay. Um, so here's a here's a simulation. Uh, a is uh, is is this is this is corresponds macroscopically to simple shearing motion. Okay. And I just want to show you that the simulated atoms, the simulated atoms are shown in blue here. They lie in the box. And their initial, that's, that's their initial positions. The non-simulated atoms are outside the box, but I'm not showing you those because if I showed you those, they would obscure everything. So I, 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 I'll only show the, the simulated atoms inside the box. But as as the simulation goes on, some non-simulated atoms you know, start entering the box, and I'll show those. Okay, so and they'll be in red. So I hope that's clear. It's the only way I know to to make it to make it clear. But anyway, <laughs> here's a so here's a typical simulation. And so what's kind of interesting is that the non -sim, the simulated atoms quickly diffuse into the non-simulated atoms. So the the simulation is highly chaotic. And you can see they look bigger. Some of them look bigger. That's because they're closer to you. And uh, that's the typical. So that's a typical situation in one of these, uh, one of these simulations where you don't have, um, you know, organ very well organized uh, initial conditions. It's a, it turns into a gas or or a liquid, and um, the simulated atoms quickly diffuse into the non simulated atoms. Here's an example. There's a lot of physics you can capture with this method because um, I claim it's it's a it's it's a pretty good way of of simulating a macroscopic motion. In fact, I'll talk a lot about that in the in the coming slides. But uh, here's an example. So this case um, this is with the Leonard Jones potential, and um, so that's easy to do. And it and it and it's a it's an excellent fit to argon to. To these noble gases, in particular argon, and so you know, there's a standard Leonard Jones potential fit to argon, and that's the one I'm going to use. And now I'm going to take initial conditions, and A is going to be a a, a dilatation in this case, and so I'm going to be dilatating this gas. There's the simulated atoms. I'm and oh, and anyway, I'm not I'm not distinguishing simulated and non-simulated atoms in this case. So now we're doing the dilatation, um, um, and um, you can see what's happening. Droplets are forming, but if you have supercritical argon and you expand it, of course, it gets very cold, and it condenses and forms droplets. So that's a kind of I would consider a realistic simulation of the formation of droplets in argon um, using this method. So, um, and I think it would be hard to do this simulation with any other method. It's not it's not just restricted to to fluid. You know, if if you start with initial conditions that are have too much kinetic energy or too much potential energy, everything will turn into a fluid. But here's a case with starting with a crystal lattice. Now this is a three dimensional simulation, but the simulated atoms. I'm only showing the simulated atoms in this case. The other ones are outside. You just don't see them. They're also it's three D simulation, so there's also ones in front of this. I think there's um, something like twenty five rows in the thickness direction, 
And the initial conditions contain a stacking fault. That's the red thing. And then the atoms at the end of the stacking fault are two, there are two dislocations there. And, um, and I'm choosing the A to be at the upper right here. You can see the A. Um, so now I can show you what happens. Um, so it's being sheared. It's kind of, the top is going to the right, the bottom's going to the left, if you want to say. And you can see that suddenly the uh, dislocations got close. And um, then it, they play around for a while. And then suddenly it forms a twin. So a twin boundary nucleates, and this is um, this is a I would consider realistic um, formation of a twin boundary uh, because it's known or it's believed anyway that that twin twin boundaries move by the motion of steps on the interface. So the dislocations turned into steps, and you can see you can see the formation of this twin boundary. So that's um, so we've studied this this kind of case, and I think it's uh, suited for also these kind of material science problems. Now I'm going to show you a simulation because it's totally unrealistic, has nothing to do with materials, but I, but I, very, I, I like it because it, you, it, it's, it really shows you what's happening. And you know why, is the, why are these simulations chaotic? They're, they're chaotic, chaotic because the simulated atoms quickly diffuse into the non-simulated atoms. And even though there's some kind of underlying symmetry, um, and that, now I try to really make it so that you could see the symmetry. So I have four simulated atoms. That's the ones in the box. And it's a 2D simulation. And I'm again, I'm choosing A as a dilatation. A can be chosen anything, and you know, but I cho choosing it, choosing it as just a dilatation, and in this case. So if you want, you can try to one of these four atoms, you can try to you can try to follow it and um you can see where it goes. Um so it's um, more it, unlike a, it's more like a square dance than a molecular dynamic simulation. But you can see it's chaotic. You can see that that the groups change. Uh, you, you can see uh, this complex dynamics. Um, and so, of course, I could have done it with two simulated atoms as well. If, if I do it with one simulated atom, it's a Galilean transformation. Everything moves with constant velocity. <laughs> okay. Um, now what's the what's the fundamental mathematical structure? Is is this when I do one of these simulations, essentially I'm I'm uh, on a on a uh, an invariant manifold of the equations of molecular dynamics. So you can think of it in this way. If I start p is momentum, q is position. If I start at this point, then then um, and, and then there's some manifold. In fact, the manifold is simply de described by these equations right here. Then I stay on that manifold. Um, but, but what's interesting about this manifold is um, it's independent of the material. It's, it's the same manifold whether I'm, whether I'm simulating air or water or steel. It's, uh, and so um, it's a family, and it's a family of uh, invariant manifolds that parameterized by the group parameters, and um, it's completely unstudied as as far as I know. So it's and it's a it's a time dependent family, but they, it's it's affine in time. So like I've pictured here. And actually, one thing that we really like is that it, that this manifold is is inherited exactly at the discrete level by the velocity Verlé algorithm. So that's another wonderful feature to add to the many wonderful features of the velocity Verlé algorithm. Okay, now, now I want to talk a little bit about um, passage to continuum level. So what is, if I assign an A, what's the macroscopic motion, which corresponds to the choice of A? And, um, and you can show the following, that the, the, the force on, on, a, on a, you take a collection of simulated atoms and their copies and you you take um and 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 you define a large volume by that by by the group let's say and um and then you compute the force on this this collection and in general with 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 weak assumptions on the atomic forces because the forces you know interact mostly near the boundary and the boundary um 
you know, divided by the volume goes to zero as this parallelogram gets large. The force on the collection of n cube unit cells divided by n cube goes to zero as n goes to infinity. That means that, that that can be used to show that the center of mass of the simulated atoms move with constant velocity. And let's assume this velocity is zero. Then the center of mass of all the images lie on a grid, and, it, and you can calculate what this grid is, how this grid is moving. It's, it's identity plus Tax. So the, this is the Lagrangian form of the macroscopic motion of, of all possible simulations using the translation group. So you see it's it's not any kind of simulation, but includes a lot of includes a lot of the one, a lot of simulations that would be used for experimental purposes. And the, there's also reasons for that as well. Um, if you want to write that in Eulerian form, and then it's V of Y and T is A identity plus T A minus one Y. So there they are. Those are the macroscopic motions in Lagrangian form and also Eulerian form. So here's an interesting fact: is you take, you take, uh, for example, Navier-Stokes equations, and that's Eulerian, and uh, the sigma is the stress, and um, so it would be given by the constitutive equation for the Navier-Stokes law. And if you substitute this v, this this v here, into this general balance of linear momentum. You you do this equation, you, you do this calculation, and the right hand side is zero. But for the sigma involved in Navier Stokes, the right hand side is also zero. So this is an exact solution of Navier Stokes. But it's also an exact solution of every accepted model of fluid dynamics and every accepted model of, of solid mechanics. So so it's basically a universal solution of the equations of continuum mechanics, you could say. If you want to include thermodynamics, then you have to introduce the temperature and the, the temperature that would go with these solutions is, is always a function of T. And if you substitute that into the, into the and let's, let's do Navier-Stokes with a, you know, therm, with a thermal effects. So we have say an energy equation with Fourier's law, then we would have to introduce a temperature which depends on time, and that would not be universal. So that would depend on the material constants of whatever fluid you're studying. So, um, so some things are universal and some things are not. Okay, now we want to now I want to discuss I want to discuss another direction that relates this to some something more macroscopic. Um, so I want to I want to discuss it's actually going to discuss the 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 Boltzmann equation. So. Here's a fact about these solutions. And I'm, I'm, illustrate, I'm gonna illustrate this fact with the translation group. And um, so here's a, here's a simulation, let's say. It's a cartoon of simulation. And let's consider the origin here and draw a ball around the origin. I'm doing it in two dimensions, but imagine you do it in three dimensions. And of course the molecules in this, in this ball have certain velocities. And now go to this ball which is on the grid determined by this periodicity, underlying periodicity, and, and look at the, the velocities in this ball. The velocities in this ball are different from the velocities in this ball, but you can calculate the velocities in this ball if you know the velocities in this ball. And um, the one way to say it in, 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 um, is it, you can translate that, then what the, the, molecular, the molecular density function of the kinetic theory, you know, the kinetic theory, the main equation, the equation is the Boltzmann equation, depends on T, Y, and V. It's, it's Eulerian. It depends on time, position, and velocity. And it's the probability of finding a velocity, the interpretation of the molecular density function is the probability of finding a molecule with velocity V at time T in a small neighborhood of Y, exactly what I was doing up here. And since, since the velocities in this ball are determined by the velocities in this ball, you can, you can translate that into a restriction on the molecular density function, and it's, it's this restriction. And, um, and so f of tyv is, is a function of t in, in this particular combination, which involves the choice of a. 
if you now if you take that if you take that formula and you shove it into the you, this formula right here and you shove it into the Boltzmann equation, then it's there's an exact reduction. So the Boltzmann equation exactly inherits this invariant manifold of molecular dynamics. Some special cases were were noticed previously. And uh, also some mean, mean field kinetic models also also have this have this reduction. So there's some kind of fundamental uh, okay, I should have said it, but that's that's the, that's the thing you substitute into the Boltzmann equation. Um, so there's some kind of fundamental significance to this. Um, now I should say a little bit about other groups. So let's go back to carbon nanotubes and um, let's take one this is this is the helical group. It's determined by two generators, G and H. They have these particular forms. That's the helical group. And um, and uh, let's take that group and 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 now take the simulated atoms, be the atoms in red, and act the group on the simulated atoms with appropriate parameters, and you generate a carbon nanotube. And I can use that to do molecular dynamics of a carbon nanotube. And I, I remember the the translations have to be affine in time. So I chase take this tau and replace it by a function which is affine in time. Okay. Um, okay. So here's a here's a simulation with that with that done uh, using that method. Now, if you carefully look here, I'll put my cursor there. This is being extended. In fact, this time depend dependence corresponds to stretching the carbon nanotube at constant strain rate. And you can see what's happening. It's uh, you know, some finite temperature. You can see from the vibrations, oscillations get a bit bigger. Um, at some extension, uh, something drastic happens here. There it goes. It, it, it breaks. Um, if I look at the temperature, so we we studied quite a bit. We learned we learned a lot about the behavior of carbon nanotubes by doing these simulations. But uh, some thing of general interest is you you can calculate from the simula simulation the the temperature, the mean kinetic energy of the molecules, and you see it's it's decreasing in time. Um, that means a carbon nanotube is acting more like a metal than it is like a polymer, um, and then of course it. It blows up when the failure happens. So, um, what to, uh, what to do with this method? Um, it's not a general numerical method. I mean, you only you get to choose this if you use translation group. You get to choose this A. If you use other groups. You you have very limited choices of what you can do. Um, but it has some kind of universality, and um, you could do. Our, our general experience is that with a hundred or maybe a thousand simulated atoms, you can you can really simulate macroscopic behavior and uh, using a molecular model. And um, the alternative methods are not not so great. They uh, sometimes they use fictitious forces. Um, sometimes they make assumptions about close to equilibrium. Sometimes they have small scale confining boundaries. So we've been using it for various things. There's the um, thing I just mentioned about the slip, um, and um, it's a it's a useful method. It's a useful method to determine laws for the behavior of materials. So um, uh, we noticed by doing these kind of simulations that that the Navier-Stokes. First of all, we noticed that if you do slow rates, you have this three by three matrix A near zero, um, then you beautifully, um, you beautifully uh, reproduce uh, the behavior of a Navier-Stokes fluid. The Navier-Stokes law, you know, with the right choice of viscosity and density and so forth, is, is um, um, you know, from the point of view of this, of this method of simulation is extremely accurate continuum model of molecular behavior. Or you could say the simulation method. <laughs> I don't know. Whichever way you think about it. Um, so we, but at if you go at high rates, you know, you you share something at very high rates, um, then which is uh, which has interesting applications. Um, you know, with hypersonics or with 
with um, uh, particles entering the atmosphere and so forth. Um, then, you, then the Navier-Stokes, you, you showed that the Navier-Stokes equations break down in a very serious way. And um, so then we, we used it as an experimental surrogate. We, we, we asked the question, can we find a different model, an improvement to the Navier-Stokes equations that works at both high and low rates? And we found something and uh, be very interesting to, uh, we think, to follow that up. It's an explicit law. But what I, I I could describe that, but I think I'll I'll describe um, something um, that's more recent. Um, it's and it's unpublished work, and we're trying to we're a student of mine Shivam Sharma's uh, um, setting up simulations is um, is to go further down in scale, and the the way to go further down is is to go to quantum mechanics. So we're looking for a generalization of this method of objective molecular dynamics in the in the quantum case. So you know we we have, we have this background. We have continuum mechanics. It gives rise to an exact solution. It's an exact solution for for all models of continuum mechanics, um, water, steel, rubber, so forth. Um, we 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 could see that if you if you take the statistics of the solution and you and you design and a molecular density function that that embodies the statistics of an objective molecular dynamic simulation it gives an exact reduction of the Boltzmann equation and then of course at MD you with a finite number of simulated atoms you see it seems to reproduce um, interesting behavior macroscopic behavior by doing MD simulations so um what's the next I mean one could one could try, uh, density functional theory, but that's that's static, so it's not not as interesting than it if you allow time dependence. And the simplest time dependent um, version of quantum mechanics is non adiabatic quantum mechanics. I really I really like this theory actually. Um, it's it's I'm going to read from the bottom because it's more it's easier to describe from the bottom. The Hamiltonian involves the kinetic energy in the usual form with the Laplacian. There's electrostatic, the bars are nuclear positions and we use the notation I comma K for those because that's what we're going to be using. Part of this is going to be objective molecular dynamics. Um, so, and there's electrostatic forces between the electrons and the nuclei that's embodied here. And there's electrostatic forces between the electrons and the other electrons and that's embodied here. And we solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for, for the electrons. And the nuclei are parameters in that equation. We define the, the electronic density in the usual way. It's a kind of probabilistic definition. We define the potential energy of the nuclei interacting with the electrons in the standard way using the electronic density that's calculated here. Again, the bars are the positions of the nuclei. Um, we take that potential energy, we add to that the, the nuclear nuclear potential energy. That's the, the, the ions, the nuclei interacting with other nuclei. And, and we put those together and we and we do MD, we do MD for the nuclei. So it's you could say it's quantum mechanics for the electrons coupled to molecular dynamics, classical molecular dynamics for the nuclei. And um, um, and so, okay, so that's, so then the question is, is there some kind of objective molecular dynamics um, reduction of, of this that could lead to, this is, this is uh, lots of, lots of interesting physics um, that's not approachable by DFT, time dependent behavior, um, excited states, all that kind of stuff, you know, potentially, potentially even superconductivity or superfluidity, detailed simulations of superconductivity and superfluidity is in this equations. We don't, we don't know that, but it, it's, I believe it's there. Um, so here's the, here's the basic theorems that would underlie uh, an OMD, objective molecular dynamics approach to the, to these equations. So you, you, the first, the first um, observation is, if you have 
the equations for the electrons, as I've just presented them, the time-dependent equations for the electrons, and you, you assume the nuclei are given by, again, the same old thing, time-dependent isometry group acting on some simulated nuclei. And again, this is a discrete group of isometries with affine time dependence of the translations. So typical elements are listed here. And you define the group transform. Now we had to figure out how does a group act in quantum mechanics on wave functions for the electrons. And it acts with a prefactor, but it's not the block prefactor, it's a different prefactor. And uh, then, then, um, then this, um, this uh, translated or this uh, transformed wave function satisfies also the equations for the electrons. And okay, so a quasi theorem is suppose C is uh, in the appropriate Hil Hilbert space where you have uh, existence uniqueness for the equations for the electrons subject to initial conditions that satisfies the group invariance then C satisfies this group invariance for all T. In other words, C is determined by its behavior on a, a fundamental domain of the group. So it's it's the same as molecular dynamics. Uh, and um, and then the, the 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 molecular dynamic part of the calculation is just like I've described above, even though there's a time dependence over here. <laughs> so uh, it works perfectly. So um, my student uh, Shivam Sharma is, is is has also noticed that this is also still pretty complicated um, in terms of simulation. You know, uh, even even though we're just doing Schrodinger's equation for the electrons, you know, so we we would choose a very small number of simulated electrons and simulated nuclei. Uh, still, it can be difficult. So there's there's a reduction well known in quantum mechanics, which is which is um, Uses Slater determinants that reduces it to the one dimension, the one the the one space dimension case. And um, and there's a Shivam has uh, showed that there's a reduction of these equations. That that reduction still holds is compatible with this with this these symmetries. So I guess um, I should leave some time for questions. Um, so we have ten minutes, and um, I'll stop there. And thanks very much for inviting me. Hmm. Thank you very much, Dick, for your <clears throat> inspiring presentation. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Dick. And now I'll stop recording. Um...